Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here virtually. Um, and so I'll be talking about some recent joint work with Tamar Ziegler from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, uh, which we worked out while we were together at the Institute uh, uh, this year. Um, okay, so uh, the general question we have here is um, we're trying to find some sets inside the primes. So just to remind you, if you take two, two sets A and B of integers, uh, we define the sum set A plus B to be the set of all possible pairs or possible sums of pairs of uh, one number from A, one number from B. Uh, this is sometimes also called the Minkowski sum of A and B. Um, and the general question is that inside the prime numbers, the rational primes, two, three, five, and so forth, what kind of sum sets can we find inside the primes? Um, <clears throat> so there are um, um, many results of, 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 this, of this later. So uh, you all know Vitagrado's three primes theorem that every large odd number is a sum of three primes proven by the circle method. Um, a very similar technique shows, for instance, that you can find infinitely many pairs of primes, n1 and n2, such that n1 plus n2 plus 1 is also prime. Uh, we need the plus 1 here because, of course, primes tend to be odd, and if you add two odd numbers, you don't usually get a prime. Uh, but if you add the plus 1, then it's fine. Um, in fact, you can generalize it. Um, so um, this, in 1992, the result essentially, due to Anton Balog, um, he put something, the wording is slightly different, but his method also applies here. Using the circle method, you can generalize what I just said. In fact, for any fixed k, you can find um, infinitely many k-tuples of primes, n1 up to nk, such that all the pairwise sums, if you say subtract one, are also prime. You can also add, add one if you wish. Um, but so you can find k primes such, such that the k choose two different sums, plus or minus one, are also prime. Um, so you can find basically finite subsets, finite sum sets in the primes um, just from the circle method. Um, and you can you can do a bit more actually using um, 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 some more recent results about linear equations and primes due to myself and Ben Green and, and Tamar. But okay. Um, another way of saying what I just said um, is that uh, you can find large, arbitrarily large finite sets B uh, whose restricted sum set lies in the um, plus one, lies in the primes. So the restricted sum set of B plus B with a little hat here is the same as the sum set, but we we, we exclude the um, the diagonal sum. So you, you have to add distinct elements of B rather than the same elements of B. Uh, so that's a, just a slightly smaller sum set. Um, and so this, this result of Balog that I just mentioned is equivalent to saying that you can find arbitrary large sets of primes. Um, oh yeah, I should have said that these are also primes. Um, whose restricted sum set shifted by one is also prime. Um, the restriction is kind of necessary in, at our current state of knowledge, because if you don't um, restrict to um, um, the sums to be different and you want the b's to be prime, then in order to have um, the full sum set plus one be prime, you need to find infinitely many primes p such that two p plus one is also prime. Um, and this is the Sophie Germain prime conjecture, which is believed to be as hard as the Krim prime conjecture, which is open. Um, so we need that that restriction of having distinct sums. But as long as you're only adding distinct primes, then then we're fine. Okay. Um, one corollary of this result is that the, the primes can I say so. There's this restriction um, that you have to take distinct sums, but you can remove it by you, you can divide your set of uh, your set B into two equal halves, and um, your restricted sum set of the of, of the whole set will contain the full sum set of the two halves. So as a corollary. There exist arbitrary large finite sets A and B, such that um, um, whose sum set, whose full sum set A plus B lies in the primes. Um, yeah, so the primes contain large finite subsets. Um, and as I said, um, so these methods were, were proven using the circle method um, several years ago. Um, myself and, and Tammy and Ben Green developed um, the theory of what we now call higher order Fourier analysis, or sort of a higher order circle method, which is uh, a whole story in itself, but um, as a consequence, we can actually solve other linear equations and primes. So, so just to give you one example of what th these results can prove, you can now show that you can find arbitrarily large sums, uh, sums, um, sets A of natural numbers, where not only do the um, pairwise sums lie in, say, primes minus one, but in fact, um, you can make all the non-empty sums, so the sums of, of two numbers or three numbers or four numbers or, or, or any non-empty subset you can make uh, one less than a prime. Um, um, another way of saying that is the primes minus one is what I call an IP naught set. Um, 
So that's kind of a variant of, of these biological cells. Okay. But these are all still finite patterns. Okay, so, so all these techniques allow us to only create finite subsets inside the primes. Um, and so we would like to also um, say something about infinite subsets. Um, and for a long time, these results were considered kind of out of reach um, to a large extent. But in, in recent years, there's been some breakthroughs um, in finding infinite subsets, not inside primes, but inside uh, sets of images of positive upper density. So if you have a set of images, the upper density of, of that set, uh, you restrict the set to a uh, finite interval, to minus n to n, say you look at the density inside that interval and you take a limb soup, and that's called the upper density. Okay, so sets of positive upper density are kind of large, maybe like a, say the square free numbers have upper density um, pi squared over six, or six over pi squared, for instance. Okay, so um, I just mentioned some recent results. Um, so if you have a set, if you have a large set, a set of positive upper density, uh, firstly, uh, it's known that it contains an infinite sum set. It contains the sum of two infinite sets. Uh, this was an old conjecture of Erdős, and it was only proven in 2019 by Maria Richter and Richardson. Um, and then this was very recently extended um, by a slightly different method um, that, in fact, you can contain some sets of k infinite sets, not just two. So for any k, any set of positive upper density contains the sum set of k infinite sets. So that generalizes the previous result that was proven by Frau Moreau and Richardson last year. Um, and there's a variant um, um, also conjectured by Erdős that um, A also contains um, not quite a full sum set. Uh, that's actually not possible. There are examples of sets that don't contain full sum sets of, of, any, of any infinite set. But you can contain the restricted sum set of, of an infinite set, which is also inside A, but you have to shift the um, restricted sum set by um, by, a, by a T. Um, for example, if A consists of odd numbers, then you need to shift by an odd shift in order for, for, this, for this to work. Um, so every set of positive density contains an infinite subset B, whose restricted sums also lie in A after a shift. Okay, so this is similar to this result of Balog I mentioned before, but now we have an infinite set. But I've got, and the set of primes has been replaced to a set of positive density. Um, so these are... Um, these results were conjectured by Erdős, or at least asked, like, these were questions asked by Erdős. Um, and they're proven by uh, actually methods from ergodic theory and topological dynamics. Um, they're quite nice proofs. Um, there's actually a quanto article about it if you're, if you're interested in reading more, but I will not um, discuss them further here because um, we will not use uh, these ergodic theory methods. But these results um, inspired Tammy and I to look at whether we could say something similar for the primes, even though the primes, of course, do not have positive upper density. Um, so the first observation is that um, all these results continue to hold for the primes if you assume a really powerful conjecture, which is the dixon hardy little prime tuples conjecture. Um, so this is a well-known conjecture. Uh, to state it, I need a bit of definition, uh, notation. So uh, we call a subset of the integers admissible if it avoids a, at least one residue class mod p for every prime p. So it has to avoid one of the two residue classes mod 2, has to avoid one of the Three residue classes mod three, mod five, mod seven, and so forth. Okay, so for instance, uh, this small set zero comma two is admissible. It avoids uh, the odd numbers, and it also avoids, uh, say, one mod three, one mod five, and so forth. Um, but zero comma one is not admissible because it doesn't avoid um, any residue class mod two, and zero two four is also not admissible because it doesn't avoid a residue class mod three. Um, so some sets are admissible, some sets are not, um, uh, and you can even have quite large admissible sets. Um, that are well okay they all have to have density zero but but you can have quite large ones okay for example oops um one can check that the set of odd square numbers is 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 uh, that's an infinite set which is admissible uh, basically because uh, only half of the residue classes are quadratic residues okay um all right so uh just to remind you what the uh, prime tuples conjecture is so if you have an, an invisible k tuple so k numbers which avoid a residue class mod p for every p then um, 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 this tuple is what we call prime producing, that you can find infinitely many uh, n such that when you shift the tuple by n, n plus h1 n to, up to n plus hk, that they're all prime. And in fact, the conjecture um, is more quantitative. Um, so not only do we have infinitely many prime k tuples, but if we sum the von function on those k tuples and you sum them, we should get an asymptotic that the sum of, the, of this correlation, k point correlation of the von function up to x should be x times a certain explicit constant depending on h1 and hk, which is called the singular series, which I won't um, um, define because I don't need it, uh, plus a lower order term. 
Okay, so this is the Pratipos conjecture. It's a standard conjecture, and it's it's very powerful and um, widely open. So even so, for k equals one, it's just the prime number theorem. But for k bigger than one, uh, we have in fact there is no known k tuple with two or more elements for which this conjecture is known. Um, and for example, if you could prove it for zero comma two, uh, you've proven the twin prime conjecture. Um, there are various results that this is true on the average uh, in some average sense, but 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 as stated, it is not known for any fixed k tuple. Um, in function fields, we're beginning to get some progress, but that's another story. All right. Um, so um, if you have this conjecture, then you can do all kinds of things. Uh, so it was observed by Andrew, uh, who might even be the audience, I think, um, um, some years ago, that that if you assume this conjecture, then um, oh, so this A should be a prime. Th then the primes contain um, uh, some sets of, 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 of k infinite sets for any k. So for any k, you can find k infinite, uh, infinite sets b1 through bk, where the sum set b1 plus b2 up to bk, they're all prime. Um, right, so this a should be a p here, sorry. Um, and um, um, Tammy and I observed that you can modify the argument and can get sort of the, the other type of result we mentioned, that in fact, you can find an infinite set of primes um, whose restricted sum set shifted by one is uh, is also prime, consists entirely of primes. Okay, so for finite b, this is the result of Balog, and but you can also do infinite b if you assume this conjecture. And these results are not difficult. I think Vanwell's paper is like two pages long, um, and, and this proof is, is also like half a page. Um, you basically construct these sets by a greedy algorithm. You, you construct finite sets with these properties, and you just, because of the prime tuples conjecture, you can always keep adding um, elements to each of these sets while keeping all the sums that you need to be prime. Um, uh, this is, uh, you have to be slightly careful to make sure that, that um, um, you always keep your tuples admissible so that um, you, you don't get blocked and you can't add another prime, but that, that's, that's, that's um, uh, not too hard to ensure. Okay, so the, the, these are relatively easy results and it's, um, they're easy because the, the, the prime tuples conjecture is really, really strong. Um, so of course, we are, we're more interested about um, what happens unconditionally if you don't um, um, assume this conjecture. And that's a much harder question. And in fact, um, there were no results at all in this direction until about 10 years ago. Um, so the first result is, is well known, um, but it's not usually stated in terms of infinite sum sets, but I will reformulate it in terms of infinite sum sets. So in 2014, there was this big breakthrough on the question of finding bounded gaps between primes. So uh, Yu Shang in 2014 famously showed that there is um, some h such that um, or that there are bounded gaps between primes that occur infinitely often, so that um, you can there's an h such that there are infinitely many intervals in n plus h which contain two or more primes. Um, and h was initially I think 70 million, but uh, right now the best value of h has been reduced to 246. Um, and then uh, shortly afterwards, Maynard um, um, gave a simpler proof of Zhang's result and generalized. Uh, so not only could um, you find intervals containing two primes, but you can find intervals containing k primes. So for any k, there is an h, uh, actually h subset k, sorry, uh, such that this interval contains k primes for infinitely many um, n. Uh, and the hk, in fact, grows about exponentially in, in k. It shouldn't, it should grow like k log k, um, but um, um, uh, this is the limitation of the method. Maynard uses what we now call the Maynard sieve, which is so barely able to um, to capture multiple primes, but but um, not super efficiently. So this is unwanted exponential, which we would love to remove, but unfortunately, uh, so far that's not been possible. Okay, so um, these are well-known results, and we can reformulate them in terms of, of infinite um, some sets. So um, after one application of the Pigeon principle, um, these results imply the following statements. Okay, so so Zhang's result tells us that there's at least one pair, uh, at, at, um, uh, one two element set, um, and an, an infinite set, such that the sum set of the infinite set and this two elements at zero comma h all line the primes. So this is a very opaque way of saying that, that there are bounded gaps between primes. Um, because if you think of what zero comma h plus b is, it's the set of all pairs n, n plus h, or the union of all pairs n, n plus h, where n ranges over b. So saying that there's infinitely many pairs of primes with a gap of h is exactly the same, the same as saying that the primes contain the sum set of, of one infinite set and a two element set. And because of the um, subsequent um, bound by polymath, this h, we um, we don't know what h is. You know, conjecturally, h is two. Uh, so if you have the twin prime conjecture, you, you can take h equals two, but we know that h is, that whatever this h is, it's somewhere between two and 246. But I cannot tell you effectively what h is currently. 
Okay, um, and the main answer result similarly is a similar statement that for any k, you can find a k element set A and an infinite set B such that A plus B lies uh, consists entirely of primes. Um, so um, main answer result about k tuples of small diameter um, implies that there's a sum set, in fact, it's equivalent to saying that there's a sum set of a arbitrary large but finite set A and an infinite set B lying like, inside the primes. So this is the state of the art. So we, we can get infinite sum sets where one of the two sets is infinite, but the other set is finite. Um, um, so, so that is um, what was known. Um, and so uh, what we've been able to do is get, a, um, so we were initially hoping to get something like a false infinite sum set, like the sum set, the two infinite sets A and B such that all sums A plus B are prime. Um, we can't do that. Um, we can do it with the hard individual conjecture. In fact, that was Granville's result. Uh, but unconditionally, uh, we can't do that yet. Um, and I think it's beyond reach of our methods. Um, but we can get half of an infinite sum set in the primes. So I can find one infinite sequence, A1, A2, A3, and another infinite sequence, B1, B2, B3, and so forth, um, such that not all pairs A plus B, J are prime, but only those A plus B, J where I is less than J. So if you think of the, the sums as being arranged in, a, in, a, in, a, in an infinite grid, um, sort of the only the upper triangular or lower triangular portion of those sums are prime. So we can make half of the sums prime, but so we have sort of an infinite partial sum set in the primes. Um, yeah, so, so this result is stronger than Maynard's result because if you restrict the A set to just the first K elements, um, then we get um, infinitely many shifts of the first K tuple, uh, A1 to AK being prime. Um, so this result uh, generalizes Maynard's result, and we use the same sieve uh, that Maynard uses uh, to prove his result. Okay, um, so this is our uh, main theorem. Um, there's another way of phrasing it um, in terms of what we call prime producing tuples. Okay, so a tuple of k numbers a1 to ak, we say it's prime producing if there are infinitely many shifts of that tuple n plus a1 up to n plus ak, which are all prime. So for example, the trim prime conjecture is asserting that zero comma two is a prime producing tuple. Um, so we don't know that. Um, the only prime producing tuples we can actually prove unconditionally are singletons. Um, with the, there is no larger set than a singleton, which is prime producing, which is kind of embarrassing, but that, that's uh, the state of the art. Um, at least there's no explicit one, but um, because of the result, result of Shang, we know that there exists a prime producing pair. There, is a, there, there exists a pair of two numbers, A1 and A2, which is prime producing. Um, I can't tell you which pair it is. I know that it, um, I can make the first element zero and the second element somewhere between two and 246, but I can't tell you exactly what it is. Um, Maynard's theorem uh, asserts that you can find arbitrarily large finite prime producing tuples. So for any k, there is some prime producing tuple a1 to ak, which is um, prime producing. Again, I can't tell you exactly what the tuple is. Um, I can say that its diameter is at most exponential in k, um, and I can normalize one of the elements to be zero, say, but that's about all I can do. Um, and of course, it has to be admissible. Um, and so our result, phrased in this language, is a refinement of Maynard's result. So Maynard's result produces a prime producing k-tuple for every k, but for different k, you have different k-tuples, and they are not related to each other. Um, what, our result what our result is, it's an equivalent statement, if you think about it, is that we produce an infinite infinite sequence, A1, A2, A3, and so forth, um, we don't claim that the infinite sequence is prime producing. Um, that would be the same as getting the full uh, sum set, uh, infinite sum set inside the primes. But we can make every finite segment of this infinite sequence prime producing. So there is an infinite sequence, A1, A2, A3, and so forth, so the first k elements are prime producing for every k. So um, we are producing um, prime producing k tuples that are nested, that, that each the k tuple is contained in the k plus one tuple. Uh, whereas Maynard produce, um, created k-tuples that were not um, nested. So that is our um, contribution. And um, there's an elementary argument that, that says that this version of the theorem is equivalent to uh, the previous version uh, I said before. Um, it's basically expand all the definitions and then you, you'll see it. Okay, so it, it's basically just saying a little bit more about the structure of prime producing tuples. All right, so um, now we'll talk about the proofs. So all these results of Yutan Zhang and Polymath and Maynard and ourselves, um, they rely on the strategy of Goldson, Pinson, and Yodum. So um, Goldson, Pinson, and Yodum, uh, well, first Goldson and Yodum and then Goldson, Pinson, and Yodum. Um, 
had this um, strategy over many years to try to produce um, um, small gastrogen primes, and they, they were partially successful. Um, but the um, the it the ultimate um, strategy is basically to rely on the pigeonhole principle. Um, and so there's the following elementary fact that that if you can so suppose you want to find um, uh, suppose you have some tuple A1AK. Um, oh, sorry, this should be H1HK. That's a typo. Um, so if you have some admissible tuple H1HK, and you want to find an n such that all the shifts n plus H1 up to n plus HK are prime. Or uh, maybe uh, all is too much, but maybe at least some, at least say L plus one, uh, where L is something less than K. Um, so if you want to, to get at least L of these K shifts to be prime, uh, one way to do it is that if you can find some sort of sieve weight new, if you can find some function on the integers, which is non-negative, and let's say it's finitely supported so that all these sums are finite. Uh, if you can find some non-negative function new, such that if for all your, your shifts, um, you sum new weighted by the um, indicator function of n plus hj being prime, if this sum can be made larger than L times just the raw sum of, of, of new, um, then just by the Pushnall principle, that means that there is at least, um, that means that there's at least one value of n for which this sum, okay, so um, this sum therefore has to be at least L For some n in the support of, 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 of new. Um, and that's precisely saying that at least L plus one of, um, of these guys are prime. So for instance, if you can get, uh, if you can prove this bound for L equals one, that you can get this, this ex expression bigger than one times this time here, then you know that at least two of, of these numbers are prime. And this was Yitang Zhang's approach to get bounded gastrogen primes. But if you can get this bigger than um, um, a larger number, then you can get many primes uh, in a small interval, and this was Maynard's strategy. So, basically, the um, the strategy is then to to come up with a clever choice of sieve function new, such that you can make this expression or the ratio between um, this sum and this sum as large as possible. Okay, so larger than one would give you um, pairs of primes, larger than two would give you triples of primes, and so forth. Okay, so this is the basic strategy. Okay, um, I like to view this um, strategy probabilistically. So um, these weights, um, they're usually defined by some by some sieve, um, uh, usually some variant of a Solberg sieve, actually. Um, but you can also think of this weight as a probability distribution. Well, you have, you have to normalize it. You, you divide the weight by the total sum, and that gives you a probability density. And so you can think of nu as just um, defining some random natural number, um, a random variable with, with, with this uh, density function. And um, another way of saying the previous strategy is that if you can find a random distribution of, of natural numbers with the property that um, all the shifts n plus h1 and up to n plus hk have a reasonably large chance of being prime, that, that if all of these events, n plus h1 prime, n plus h2 prime, and so forth, if they are prime with probability strictly bigger than L over k, so that when you sum over k, they're strictly bigger than L, then the pigeonhole principle will force, at least for one of these n's, that um, that you can get L plus one of these K numbers prime. All right. So uh, that's just a reformulation of this pigeonhole argument that I said uh, before. So basically, um, you want to find a sieve uh, or a, a random variable um, N such that all these numbers are, uh, all these shifts N plus HJ have a reasonably large um, likelihood of being prime. If, if you can get the probability bigger than one of a K, you can get pairs of primes bigger than two of a K, you get triples of primes and so forth. So you want something large over K. All right, now um, there's an obvious choice. Okay, so um, you could just declare new, uh, I mean, you can just force all the N's to be prime by fiat. You can make, you can define new to be um, the indicator function of the event that all the, the, the n plus h1 up to n plus h are prime. And then maybe you can restrict n to some dietic range to make it finally supported. Um, if you could choose this, um, then theoretically, um, all these probabilities would be one, because now by, by construction, every single n plus hj is prime. Um, unfortunately, um, this doesn't work because we don't even know, because we can't prove that this function doesn't vanish identically. In fact, showing that this function doesn't vanish 
is basically equivalent to this Dixon Hardy literal conjecture. Of course, if we had the prime degrees conjecture, um, we have asymptotics for this guy. And so the sum of nu is, 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 is non zero. But we can't choose this because um, the sum of nu um, could vanish. So we can't actually restrict to primes. And so what we do instead is that we replace um, this restriction of primes by some upper bound sieve, like a Solberg sieve, because those things we can sum. Um, and we lose something by doing so. And what we lose is that these probabilities drop below one. But if you can keep them above one of a K, you can still get something non-trivial. Okay, so, um, so the problem now converts to that of finding a really good sieve approximate to something like this. All right, so you can go apply a standard sieve. So you can you can you can just apply a, a standard Solberg sieve to to this um, to this problem. Uh, and if you do it naively, um, you get something, but not not something great. Okay, so if you if you if you, if you don't optimize anything, um, the uh, you can find a standard sieve, n, where the probabilities are n plus h one of n plus h k or prime um, is something like exponentially small in k. Um, I think if you're really Careful, you can make it poly polynomially small in k. But remember, we need to get at least one of a k in order to be um, be useful. Okay, so this by itself doesn't really help. Um, now, so the breakthrough um, of goldstein pitts and Yoderim was to um, um, choose a certain Silberg sieve type expression here, which um, well, okay, I won't go through it, but it's 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 it, 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 so it, it looks like a, um, uh, what you would see in, in standard Silberg sieve with just a few, a few tweaks. Um, and uh, if you combine it with the bombay um, uh theorem, uh, they could get, um, they could almost get bounded gaps. Um, so they needed to exceed one of the k, and they they oh, they just missed. They got one of the k minus um, something that, that that goes to zero. So they couldn't quite get bounded gaps between primes. Um, this was good enough to get small gaps between primes, um, gaps between primes that were smaller than the average gap, but not actually bounded gaps. Um, and if you assumed anything better than the Bombier-Vinogradov theorem, you could you could get bounded gaps. For example, if you assumed um, the elliott halberstam conjecture. So this is what um, Gorsen, Pinz, and Yodorum did. Um, Yi Tang Zhang um, he he made um, a slight modification to uh, the Gorsen, Pinz, Yodorum sieve. He basically restricted the moduli to be smooth. Um, but the main work he did was was to um, improve the Bombier-Vinogradov inequality. So um, the bombier vinogradov inequality is a statement about primes in arithmetic progressions. Um, usually, it only is useful for, for primes of spacing up to like x one half. But he was able to get a little bit above x one half the smooth moduli. Um, and the upshot of that rather complicated work was that he was able to improve the gaussian pinzildrum bound from 1 over k to 1 plus a small constant over k. Um, and this was just good enough to get bounded gas between primes. All right, so uh, this was basically how Yi Tang Zhang's work proceeded, um, oversimplifying a lot. Um, and the polymath project sort of optimized that and, and also, uh, also Maynard's work. Okay, so um, Maynard uh, then introduced um, uh, what we now call the Maynard sieve. And uh, it's a similar sieve. Uh, so the uh, Ghost and Pins Yodem sieve, um, you sieve, you, you take all these numbers, emphasis H1 up emphasis HK, you multiply them all together, and you sieve over the factors of the product. And then with some sieve weight. Um, so Maynard observed that you can do better by being more flexible. So rather than sieve over divisors of the product, you, you factor the product into individual pieces, you sum over divisors of the pieces, and you, you choose a more flexible weight um, to sieve over. Um, actually, technically, um, Maynard didn't, this is what we would call the smooth Maynard sieve. Uh, he used what we might call the, um, uh, the rough Maynard sieve, but that, that's a um, where um, F is not necessarily a smooth function, but something a bit more arithmetic structure. But it, it doesn't really matter. The, um, both sieves give the same um, um, uh, results, pretty much. Um, but anyway, um, Maynard worked with sieves like this. And uh, this is a function of, of many variables, uh, d1 up to dk. So there's another typo here, which should be dk. Um, and um, you can optimize an F. Um, and it turns out that uh, because of the multivariable nature of this function, you can squeeze an extra log k um, out of this sieve compared to the GVY sieve. And so the, the upshot was that um, by a careful choice of f um, and just using the vanilla bombier vinogradov theorem, he did not need Zhang's fancy um, vinogradov, um, bombier vinogradov theorem, he could show that the um, um, with this weight, the probability that each of the events is prime is now a bit bigger than one of k, log k over k. And so you can, you can force at about log k of the, k, of the k numbers to be prime. 
Um, and so this is how he was able to create arbitrary large parameters and tuples. All right. Um, so this main adjective is actually has other properties. Okay, so I mean, this this is the basic property that makes the main adjective useful, that, that it, it is somewhat likely that, that each of these shifts are prime. Um, but um, you'd like more. Okay, so, so all these events have somewhat large probability. It would be nice to have them all independent. Um, then you could do a lot more. Uh, but proving independence of these events is about as hard as the uh, the full Hardy Ludwig um, prime tuples conjecture. So that we can't do. Um, but um, Banks, Freiburg, Freiburg, and Maynard observed that you can at least get uh, correlation upper bounds. So, for example, if you want the event to control the event that both of these numbers are prime, you'd expect this to be about the square of the event that, that one of them was prime, uh, if you believe that these events are independent. Um, so we can't prove that, but by using um, just a bit more sieve theory, um, you can show that you can at least get the expected upper bound up to a constant that um, lose a factor of like four or something. But um, the probability that, that both of them are prime is bounded above by a constant times the square of the previous bound. So we do get some second moment control, but only uh, upper bounds. Um, you can also control third moments and fourth moments by a, a similar method, uh, but, the, uh, but they're not super useful. The, the bounds just get worse and worse. Um, but um, this extra information is uh, is quite handy. Um, so Banks, Freiburg, and Maynard use use this to um, um, uh, get new results about uh, I think um, the limit points of uh, normalized gaps between primes. So you take the gap between consecutive primes, p n plus one minus p n, you divide by log n, um, and they show that this set converged to um, the, the limit points of the set are quite large. I think that has, has measured at least one ninth or something. Um, uh, so um, these, these are quite useful additional estimates that um, this, this sieve enjoys. Um, so um, the way our, uh, Tammy and I prove our theorem is that we modify um, this method. Um, so instead of having just sort of one k-tuple and, 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 and sort of um, design a sieve at, um, attached to one k-tuple, we, we um, have a tuple which we arrange into buckets. Uh, so we have an admissible tuple which consists of i subtuples, uh, one of size j1, one of size j2, and another, and so forth, and up to a bucket of size j i plus one. So we have a big tuple of primes that we split up into a, a certain number of buckets. And for each bucket, for the ith bucket, uh, we can make um, all the shifts in the ith bucket prime with a reasonably high probability. That um, so in in the ith bucket uh, there are j i. J, I, J sub i primes, and I can we can make each of these shifts prime with probability about one of a J i. And also um, within each bucket, we can make the probability that, that a pair of them are both prime about one of a J i squared. Okay, so we have J i events, which are all the size of one of a J i, and they don't overlap too much. They're somewhat disjoint. Um, so they're still pretty small, but um, the advantage of, um, of getting bounds like this is that uh, you can just take the you can combine them using either inclusion exclusion or Cauchy Schwartz, and um, if you combine all the events in a single bucket into one big event, so if you, if you define E i to be the event that that at least one of the shifted primes in the ith bucket is prime, um, then um, because each of the events has size one, probably one of a j i and there's j i of them and they don't overlap too much, uh, you can show that the total probability is somewhat like it's about an absolute constant. Okay, so, um, so to summarize, we found some random variable um, n, and then we found these, these finite number of events, e1 up to, up to ei, where each of them occur somewhat often, um, that the, the probability of each of these, which is sort of a prime producing event, is bounded away from zero. It's bounded by an absolute constant. Um, now, here we, we are dealing with the, uh, uh, a finite number of, of events. Um, but it turns out that there's, there's a standard trick in um, ergodic theory that once you have a situation involving um, a finite number of events um, from one up to i, but i can be set arbitrarily large, there's a way to, to pass through limits in i to infinity. And you can actually work in an abstract probability space where instead of having a finite number of events, you actually have, have an infinite number of events, e1, e2, e3, e4, and so forth, which all occur with, with large probability. And if you can prove some combinatorial statement about the infinite, seek, um, um, family events, you can deduce various things about the, um, the, um, these finite config configurations of events. Um, so the, the fancy name for this is the first cosmonos principle. 
but let me just wave my hands and 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 say that you can you can send I to infinity by by a trick. Um, basically, the the Azalea Scully theorem. Uh, it's just some tricks from analysis. Okay, um, so now we have an infinite sequence of events um, in a polarity space, and they're all somewhat large, um, but um, they could still be somewhat disjoint, um, and we we want um, them to intersect each other in some nested way. Um, and it turns out that there was a tool already just ready made for this um, that was proven by Vitaly Bergelson um, almost 40 years ago. Um, so it's an abstract lemma in probability theory that is, is, is very convenient, um, which is that uh, suppose you have a sequence of events, an infinite sequence in, in, in a probability space E1, E2, E3, um, and they are all large. So they all occur with probably at least, say, 1%. Okay. Now they could still be somewhat disjoint, okay? So you know maybe E two and E four don't overlap, or maybe E two and E four overlap, but their intersection doesn't in, in, intersect E six. Um, but among this infinite sequence of events, you can show that there exists a subsequence of events E I one, E I two, E I three, and so forth, um, which intersect each other a lot, um, in the sense that any finite number of the subsequence of events um, has positive intersection. So, so while the, the whole sequence doesn't need to intersect um, each other, um, there is a subsequence, and in fact, even a subsequence of positive density. There's a subsequence of events uh, which, um, uh, such that any finite number of these events overlap. Uh, so, and so any, any finite number um, has a positive um, intersection. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of a fancy version of the original principle. I mean, intuitively, if you're trying to cram together an infinite number of um, of events uh, of, of large probability in, into a, a probability space of measure one, you know the pigeon principle already tells us that at least two of them have to have to overlap. Uh, but in fact, you can get a whole infinite sequence which they, which all overlap each other. Um, the proof is actually not hard. Um, you, you 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 take the average of the indicator functions and you take the limit and you apply for two's lemma. And this this is the, this is like a, a five line um, argument. But I won't give I won't give the proof here. It, it, this is elementary. But if you apply this lemma to the previous situation, uh, you can find a subsequence of buckets. So you have these infinite buckets, infinite sequence of buckets, and each one corresponds to an event that something is prime. Um, and applying this lemma, you can find an, 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 a subsequence of buckets where um, um, any finite number of, 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 um, of, 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 of these buckets, um, the events intersect so that, that um, one of these, or any K, um, the probably that, that that the first k buckets of the subsequence produce a prime um, is is positive, and um, and that pretty much cl closes the argument. You, you need one more application of the original principle, um, but this is uh, that, that's basically how we prove our main theorem, which I'm restating here. That there's uh, infinitely that you can find two infinite sequences such that that um, um, the partial sum um, is the whole prime. Uh, we can actually move a little bit more than this. Um, so um, it's, it's not only just the case that uh, there exist two sequences, but um, we can say a bit more about the sequence A1, A2, and so forth. Um, in fact, um, our method proof shows that given any infinite admissible set, for example, the odd squares, there is a, an infinite subset. We, we can place the AIs inside any admissible set we wish. So for example, the odd squares are, are, are admissible. So I can make the, uh, the A1, A2, A3 all odd squares uh, if I wish or um, any other uh, admissible set. So um, it's actually a slightly stronger um, statement than, than, than what I said here. Um, that type of claim had actually pr previously been proven um, by a McGrath, who's a student of James Maynard. If you replace primes by um, some of the two squares, then um, there's a similar statement. Now, of course, the, the, um, um, the, earth, the, the uh, this theorem as stated is trivial for some of the two squares, because um, I can just take A's to be the squares and B's to be the squares. Uh, and then A alpha B J or some sort of two squares. Um, but um, um, McGrath observed that you can actually place um, one of these sets inside any admissible set you wish. Um, and that, that's not a trivial statement. Um, so McGrath actually used a similar method. Um, the difference between McGrath's method and our method, so he also used um, the main art sieve um, adapted to some sort of two squares. Um, the difference is that for some sort of two squares, um, so as I said, um, for primes, we don't get asymptotic. So, so pair collisions of primes are hard. This is as hard as, as the trim prime conjecture, at least. Um, so we can only get upper bounds for these pair collisions and not asymptotics. Um, but for sums of two squares, the situation is better. And actually, for pair collisions or sums of two squares, asymptotics are known. 
Um, the problem is sort of comparable in strength to representing a number of sum, the sum of four squares, or um, actually the difference of two squares and, and then two other squares. And so, you know, the, the Klusterman type methods uh, work in this case. Yeah, so um, uh, McGrath was able to take advantage of asymptotics in the um, uh, pair correlations. And so he, he could bypass the use of his inter intersectivity lemma. Um, so our innovation basically is that we, we only have upper bounds on pair correlations, but we can still proceed by using this intersectivity lemma. Um, there's some amusing corollaries to our result, which um, are, um, okay, I mean, they, they come from dynamics. And so uh, maybe they're um, uh, uh, not as much of interest to, to number theory, so I'll state them anyway. Um, so um, you can think of the primes actually as an element of the, pow of the power set of the integers. Okay, so the power set of the integers, I do not treat as z. Uh, topologically, this is a Cantor space. It's the product of zero comma one, uh, infinite many copies of zero comma one. So it has the topology of of of, um, of a Cantor space, and the primes are just one point in this Cantor space. And then if you shift the primes, you get by by some shift h, you get another point in the Cantor space, and so you get what's called the orbit of the primes, and that's some countable set inside this candle space. And then you can take the orbit closure. Um, so you take the closure in the, the weak topology. Um, and that, that gives you what's called the orbit closure of the primes. And that's some compact subset of, of the candle space. Um, and um, in principle, knowing this orbit closure tells you a lot about the primes. Um, so um, the reason why this is a nice object is compact, and it also has a, um, it's, it's, it's shift invariant. So it, it has a nice continuous shift, and then you can apply methods of topological dynamics to analyze this space. Um, we think we know what this orbit closure is. So if, if we assume the dixon heidegger prime tuples conjecture, um, the orbit closure is just the original set of shifts together with all the admissible subsets of Z. So, so, so every admissible set uh, should be in the orbit closure. Um, conversely, uh, we can show that every non-trivial, um, any, any limit point of this set must actually be admissible. That's not hard. But uh, it's it conjecture that, that all the admissible points, admissible sets are in this closure. Um, so we can't show that, but uh, we were, uh, we can at least show this orbit closure is large. So uh, in the in the set theoretic sense, we can show that the cardinality of this orbit closure is um, the cardinality of a, of a continuum. In fact, it's basically the union of a, of a countable set and a perfect set. Uh, and perfect sets, a non-empty perfect set, and perfect sets have the cardinality of the, of the continuum. Um, yeah, so so that we could prove by um, a, a, a nice little argument actually supplied to us by Joe Hankins, a, a set theorist. Um, so that's one cute application. Um, there's um, there's also some abstract nonsense. Um, so um, sets that contain infinite partial sum sets actually um, have a name, uh, which uh, I think they're called RP sets. Um, and uh, one sort of function theoretic consequence of our results is that you can find a function on the primes supported on the prime, a bounded function supported on the primes, which is not uh, weakly almost periodic, which means that if you shift it, if, if, if you look at all the shifts of this of this function on the primes, um, you do not get a, 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 um, uh, um, a pre-compact uh, set in the weak topology of L infinity. Um, yeah, so, so this is a standard notion of periodicity. Um, yeah, and it's uh, um, yeah, it has to do with the fact that every time the, the um, you can shift the, the primes so that they contain a k tuple, and then you can shift the primes so that they contain a k plus one tuple that contains the k tuple, and so on and so forth. And if you just sort of take a random function of the primes, you can use that to um, uh, to create a, um, uh, to exhibit a non um, weak almost periodicity. Um, yeah, so those are just some some amusing uh, consequences of our main theorem. I think that's, that's all I have. So thank you very much for your attention.